Hey everybody, my name is Sam Solomon and this is Signal Tower. I know it's been a while since our last show, but we've got a really great treat today. Today our guest is Alex Mark, who is a designer, a Techstars hack star. He's the founder of Truthly, which is a health research aggregator. In this interview today, we'll discuss some of Truthly's launch strategies and how do you search for a co-founder. We'll also talk about what the best way to gain startup experience is. And if you think it's starting a business, Alex has another idea. All right, let's get started. Alex, hey welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Glad to be here. Well, let's get started. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what was your path like to, to becoming an interface designer? Um, I think I took a pretty unconventional route, but I don't think there's really a, a conventional route to becoming an interface designer. Um, I also do user experience as well. Um, I started out in uh, high school doing graphic design, and I just did that because of free time and because of interest. And uh, I got good at Photoshop and Illustrator and all that jazz. Back then, um, went to college, and I actually studied psychology, and I didn't do any design. Um, but when I graduated college, I knew that I wanted to start a company, and I wanted to do it in a way where I would get all the experience on the job. So it was sort of like a, a test around the trial run to, uh, to starting a real business. So I, uh, I started an impact clothing company, and uh, I did that for two years right out of college. And uh, I mean, it was, it, was, it was pretty successful. We raised enough money for a couple Ugandan villages to get clean water. Um, and it was, a, it was a good experience, but I had to do all the design for that. So I used that graphic design uh, knowledge that I got in high school to, to do that. Um, and that was kind of my first foray into like web design and everything. And uh, I realized after that, you know, this is something I can use as a skill to make myself more valuable to startups, to, uh, to you know, start my own design company or whatever. So I actually started learning UI. Um, and then I uh, started a, a dev shop, designed a dev shop with a friend. Um, and I did that for about three months before I became a, a hack star. And uh, I just willed myself into, into learning it, essentially. <laughs> um, with that graphic design background and the psychology really helped with the user experience side of it. So yeah, there's really no like you know direct path. I didn't go to school for it or anything. But uh, it ended up, you know, ended up well, so yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about about Impact Clothing Company. Um, you know what what types of clothing were you were you selling? How you know where did that? Why that company? Yeah. So back in college, um, there were a lot of fundraising events. You know, fraternities had fundraisers. Uh, there were a bunch of other fundraising type events, and I really hated it because most of the people that were participating in those were doing it for the resume. Doing it for, you know, the the look of it essentially, and not because they actually cared. So I wanted to do something that was like, so crazy and like, so into the actual like helping part of it, and not at all for the for the profit and for the for the looks and for the you know, the glory that essentially that comes with I don't know if glory is the right word, but it comes with doing a nonprofit. So I started that, and that's that kind of what got got me into it. Uh, and I was donating. 100% of the profits for clean water. So we were donating to Charity Water and to a, a nonprofit that we worked with. Um, but uh, for that, um, I had to do all the design for the. Uh, so it was mainly uh, T-shirts, and then um, we had some design clothes. You know, we had hoodies, we had uh, water bottles. So it started out pretty small, uh, and by the time I ended, it was kind of the inflection point where um, we could have gone from these pre-designed, pre-cut pre clothing um, where we were just getting screen printed um, to more cut and sew and I had a, a, a manufacturer lined up and everything and we had designs and I said no, that this is not what I want to do with my life, it's really hard, I'm not making money so I had to shut that down. But yeah, I did all the design for the, for the clothing at that point so I had kind of learned about fashion design, did all the website design um, and everything kind of came together, it was interesting. Do you think that that starting that business was the the most valuable thing that you've done as far as you know, kind of entrepreneurship? Uh, interestingly, no. I would actually say not at all. 
Um, and I think you get a lot of people who say, just go start a business and that's going to be the best experience for learning business. Right. And I would actually say that's not true, especially if you're into startups. The best experience is going to work for a startup. Um, that that helped me learn. Like if I learned about fashion, I learned about clothing design, I learned about design, but those are all skills that can be learned, right? right. I didn't learn about the business side of it. I didn't learn the like what I needed to do to succeed because I didn't succeed. I didn't know the value of networking at the time. I didn't know, um, you know, how how hard it was going to be to donate all the money <laughs> and not have any cash reserves, right? So, so these like business aspects of it, I actually didn't learn, um, and like learning that okay, yeah, I shouldn't have donated all the profits because we should have been keeping cash reserved, and that was that was kind of a crazy business model that, you know, yeah, I learned that, but that doesn't really help me in the future, right? So, so I would say no. Um, the best experience for me was was actually being a hack star and working with you know ten early stage companies and seeing the struggles they went through. Uh, that was to me was a lot more valuable. That's interesting because you know for me it, the I learned so much from starting my business, but um, you know I, now that I think about it, I went to go work for Dr. Crono, which was a, a YC company. After that, yeah. after I graduated from college, and uh, it, it was in a business that I didn't know that much about. It was it's it, we basically create healthcare software, EHRs for the iPad, and uh, I, I learned an incredible amount oh, while I was there. Um, so yeah. I, I definitely see your point. Yeah, um, I think I think people think you learn a lot from failure, and I think you do learn a lot from failure. But I think you also learn a lot from seeing success uh, and being a part of success. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so t tell me a little bit about being a hack star. So what what does that actually mean? Uh, so the hack star program is interesting. It's essentially like the single founder program for tech stars. So if you're an entrepreneurial type person and you have a skill set, so you're a designer or developer, um, and it's sort of developer focused, but there's definitely uh, at least one designer per program, um, it's a great system to kind of learn if, if you really want to be an entrepreneur, uh, get like an insane amount of knowledge really quickly about, <laughs> about starting a company, um, about fundraising, about mentorship, about networking, uh, building a huge network. So it, it uh, the program itself was was just yeah. The way they describe it is a fire hose of, of knowledge and information and networking. <laughs> that's basically that's basically what it was. So it's just constant head to the grindstone, like shit coming at you all the time. It was fun. Very cool. Very cool. Um, well, let, let's talk a little bit about Truthly. Um, I guess you know. Oh, I, I, I sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, Excuse me. Oh yeah, um, I just forgot to mention what we actually. Yeah, I forgot to mention what we actually did during the program. Uh, <laughs> so uh, during the Hacksaw program, you get to work with all the companies, uh, kind of as a um, a mercenary uh, a contractor. So a company will come to you and say, "We need this." Uh, by you know three weeks from now, and you get to choose. Okay, should I take that project or not? If you choose to take the project on, then you know you work with that company, and you end up going in deep with uh, around two or three companies, really building a significant amount of product, helping the teams move the ball forward. Um, but you're constantly being bombarded by teams because they're always like strapped for for product, and um, the goal is essentially to help the teams build product faster. So. And were you when you were there? Are you an employee of TechStars? Because you're not really part of any of those individual companies you're working with, right? Yeah, you're an employee of TechStars. Uh, you're an independent contractor for TechStars, and you're you're essentially uh, a contractor that TechStars has brought in and vetted to work with all the companies. But at the same time, you also go through the program as if a founder would. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, well now let's move on to, to Truthly. Tell us a little yeah. bit about it. Sorry, I, I lost that last part. What was that? Said it, now let's move on to Truthly. Uh. So um, I guess, you know, I in the introduction I kind of gave it, you know, it's a it's a it's a health research aggregator. Um, yeah. would you go into a little bit more detail and kind of tell us a little bit about what you're doing with it? Yeah, sure. So 
what I realized, uh, and I've had my own health issues before, is that it's really, really difficult to find trustworthy, uh, personalized, accurate health information online. You mainly get articles, blogs, and, and like slideshows, so just right. health content. And health content is terrible. Uh, what we're trying to do is is disrupt that whole model with a platform model that connects consumers to health research. And the way we do that is kind of like a, imagine a stack overflow. So a, a user can search for a health issue uh, and then filter by different variables. So I could search for uh, heart disease and then I could filter by uh, omega-3s and um, you know, over 50, for instance. And I get a list of all these findings uh, and they're all research backed. So it's not question and answer like stack overflow, but it's research validated content, right? And then within that, we do a lot of cool things, and we're going to do a lot of cool things in the future. So I was looking at the, at the Truthly app, and it definitely, you know, compared to going to, you know, some of these other sites, uh, you know, it's definitely a, a lot cleaner. Information seems to be pretty well organized. Um, you know, I, I guess is, you know, how are you going to differentiate yourself out there from some of the bigger ones, though? Like WebMD, obviously, is, you know, kind of yeah. a go-to resource. Um, yeah. How are you guys going to differentiate yourselves? Well, so WebMD is great for a diagnosis. So if you have like a skin rash, right, I can go WebMD and it'll tell me what it is. But it's not good for wellness. So nutrition and fitness. If I do nutrition a month, if I'm researching nutrition and fitness, which is you know, huge, over a hundred million uniques, right? Right. Um, I mainly get articles. And there are articles written by people who may or may not know what they're talking about. They're referencing other articles. Uh, you have to wade through all this misinformation. The other problem with WebMD is, okay, now I have a diagnosis, right? What do I do after that? Now I know that I have uh, myocardial infarction. What do I do after that? There's right. things that I can do. There's treatments that I can take. There's supplements. There's lifestyle changes, right? Um, I was actually talking to uh, a doctor, and she's one of our mentors, um, about a week ago, and she... she uh, she had MS. Uh, for four years, she couldn't walk. She had to use a cane, a walker. She was on MS drugs, right? She realized that there's research on diet and nutrition, or uh, nutrition and MS. She changed her diet. It's totally symptom-free now. She's been symptom-free for the last six years. Wow. So this is kind of an example of this is a person who's a doctor who should know research and literally had no access to this information. This is life-changing information, and what we're doing is bringing that to the surface, making that available. Uh, we've got a platform that actually makes it easy to cross-reference that information. So um, she can look at MS diet in people with, you know, like a, a woman versus a man, right? That's a different, totally different subset. Maybe it works for somebody, maybe it works for, it doesn't work for other people. So um, that's where our value lies in wellness and, and, and in um, treating these conditions. Well, and, you know, I think one of the things is, you know, I feel like a lot of these research papers, you know, are very in-depth, and people kind of want, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, there's, you know, they're kind of tough for people to read. Um, yeah. You know, what are you guys doing uh, visually to kind of, like, organize some of this information and make it easier to yeah. digest? Yeah, so again, imagine the Stack Overflow model, right? Everything in Stack Overflow is based around a question, right? It's a question and then an answer. For us, it's the research paper and then the answer, okay? So the research paper is the backing idea for, for whatever piece of content, whatever knowledge that we're trying to distribute, right? And then on top of that, our content team actually reads that research, summarizes that, makes it easy to understand. We tag it with tags so you can sort and filter this information. Um, and in the future, we're actually going to be able to personalize that information to you. So again, uh, diet and MS for, for a woman is totally different than diet and MS for a man, right? What are the dietary uh, changes you need to make? They're totally different depending on the person. Um, and being able to take the research and say, this is the demographics of this research study, and this is the user's health history, and we can actually match that up and give you the most accurate, the most trustworthy, research-backed information. It's really powerful. Wow, yeah. That, that sounds like you guys definitely have some, some, some ambitious plans. So um, yeah. that's great. Um, 
So I, I guess right now it's you know truthfully is in alpha. You know, is it is it just you working on it? Do you have a team? Um, yeah, so it's just me right now. Uh, I'm actually looking for a co-founder. Uh, super picky about about that. <laughs> well, that's a good thing um, to be picky about, right? But I have a uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I have a content team who's. Uh, Doing the research and reading the research, uh, and they're they're great. They're awesome. They're a bunch of uh, students who've done their own research and, and know what they're talking about. Um, but I um, I've been able to to get this off the ground. We launched our alpha uh, three weeks ago. We've seen a ton of traction, uh, over twenty thousand uniques in just three weeks, which is pretty crazy. Um, we've really been focusing on validating that that people want this content, and so far we've done that. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, co-founder is extremely important, and I'm not going to take this journey alone. But um, right now, that's where that's where I'm at. And and so, yeah, I guess you know, why do you feel like you need a co-founder? Um, it's a it's a good question. Uh, I guess for for people who don't you know understand startups as well, um, co co-founder is really important because. You need somebody to bounce ideas off of. If you're just in your head the whole time, like this is a good idea, this is a bad idea, <laughs> you're you're eventually going to be led astray. I think. Uh, so I think that's the number one reason. The second reason is you have to delegate and, and and split up tasks. And so I need somebody who can build product while I'm out networking or raising money or whatever, um, or designing or you know. So those are the two main reasons. And accelerators really won't give you a a, a second look unless you have a co-founder. Even me having the TechStars pedigree, knowing the entire like TechStars family, I uh, I'm pretty sure I won't get into TechStars unless <laughs> unless I have a co-founder. So it's definitely valuable. You mentioned that uh, you got about twenty thousand uniques in you know uh, three weeks. You know what what activities did you do um, when you guys were trying to launch? Like that's a pretty that's a pretty solid number. How you know what did you do? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we first focused. So we picked a, a segment that was really small, um, but really active, and they didn't have a solution for the problem. And that segment was uh, rosacea, and then eventually acne. So these two skin disorders. And we said, okay, they need this information. They're like posting about it on the forums. They're posting links to articles and, and things. Um, we can come in and give them, and they actually had an, art, uh, uh, an article that said, can we get all the research in one place? And it was like this forum post. Um, so we're like, okay, this is a good community for us to start out with, right? <laughs> so uh, we took that, we uh, turned it into um, community-based user acquisition model in the beginning. So we were posting on these forums, we kind of integrated ourselves into the forums, and then we just linked back to these articles. Um, we went on Reddit. We were doing the same thing. We were, we were linking back to our articles. We actually had a Reddit post go viral, which was pretty pretty crazy. Uh, we got to the second page of Reddit, which I was I was pretty That's awesome. With. Um, yeah. So it was it was manual in the beginning, um, and now we're testing kind of secondary social uh, user acquisition models. Mm -hmm. So we're testing Pinterest, which actually has a really high conversion rate. We're testing Twitter again, which is a really high conversion rate. Uh, and we're seeing the difference between our targeted traffic, which is the traffic that uh, has, a has a problem with rosacea or acne, and our untargeted traffic, which is like our Reddit traffic. Um, so those are the main models. But we're, it's, it's all testing based right now. We just want to say, okay, how much traffic can we get if we have, say, 150 Twitter followers, right? Okay, let's model that out to 1,000 Twitter followers and 10,000 Twitter followers. How long is it going to take to get there? How much traffic is that going to send us continually? And uh, eventually, what do we need to do to get to a million users, right? It's kind of the first baseline goal. Interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of curious. So are you seeing a lot of people, you know, tweeting, you know, kind of tweeting about, you know, these specific articles? Because just, you know, anecdotally, I, you know, I feel like a lot of the, like, healthcare stuff is something that is kind of private that people, you know, want to, like, find and research on their own but may not necessarily want to share. But you guys have found otherwise, right? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, the two things that we've 
we've really found are um, people get really into groundbreaking information. So something that they, they don't know, but kind of changes their perception of something, they really want to share that. And because our information is, is, is like a snippet size, right, we have this title, it's really easy to share. Um, that's kind of where we see Reddit and, and those social communities getting really excited. And then with, with Twitter, for instance, if you go on Twitter and you do a search for, for acne or for um, any kind of like science-based information, you'll see that um, people will post the link, like they'll post a sentence and then a link to an actual scientific article or to a, a piece of content that talks about a scientific article. And those do really, really, really well on Twitter. I mean, if you know like I fucking love science, they have 12 million followers, and I'm mean, not on Facebook, but um, it's it's an incredible how these little snippets of science people get really excited about. Uh, in in terms of health, it's the exact same way. It's actually more sticky for health than for kind of generic science. Uh, it's just they don't tweet about it as a personal experience. They tweet about it as uh, this is information I find interesting. So. Huh? Wow, that is interesting. Well, so thinking ahead, kind of, you know, what, I guess, what obstacles do you see? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a bunch. This is a, a really tough problem that obviously probably would have been solved before if it was easy. Uh, I think that's, right. that's kind of how it is for, <laughs> for most things. Um, I mean, we've got science over here, which is so dense and so difficult to, I apologize for the, for the noise in the background, so dense and so difficult to parse through, right? We can't just develop an algorithm to then translate that into human speak. We actually have to manually do that. So we have a, a model for scaling that, but um, that's one of the main obstacles, is, is getting this information in a way that, that consumers can understand. Um, the second is uh, with some of the data visualization and, and um, like analyzing this, this database of research that we're going to have, uh, we're going to have to have some, some quality big data analysts um, we want to plug into like Watson and everything, so the the uh, mathematical science part of it is, is going to be difficult. And then uh, the co-founder obviously is is a big uh, obstacle, but it's not an insurmountable one. Um, and then uh, finding people who who uh, understand the spaces that we're in, because we kind of straddle three spaces. We straddle science, right? We have science and research on one side, which is if you know anything about that, that's exploding and being disrupted as we're talking. I mean, I know, I know uh, the founder of ScienceGate. There's ResearchGate. There's uh, Mendeley, which was acquired by Elsevier for 100 million. So research itself is being disrupted, and it's a totally whacked out old model. It's shit, right? Then there's health, which is being obviously everyone knows that's being disrupted like crazy. Um, and then there's consumer, right? We're a consumer app. So it's finding someone that understands, you know, investors co-founders, whatever, people that understand all those spaces is almost impossible, and that's one of the big obstacles that, that I'm actually finding. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, and, and as far as a co-founder goes, you know, who exactly are you looking to join you? What type of person? Uh, so, two specific types of people. Obviously, the back-end developer. I'm front-end. I do design. I'm a UX designer. We talked about this. Um, and I do a little bit of, of Rails, um, but Back end is a uh, is a big need because we have to keep the product moving forward, and that person needs to be strategic. They need to be intelligent. They need to, you know, like I said, I need to bounce ideas off them and, and develop a vision for the for the uh, uh, startup. And then uh, secondary would also be uh, somebody who understands health and research uh, and can build our content team, figure out scale this model. Um, and make sure that the quality of information, I mean, we're going to do some algorithmic things and all that, make sure the quality of information we're presenting is the highest quality, but understandable for the user. And, and where do you go to find a, a co-founder? Like, obviously, you're pretty involved in, in Techstars and some of these yeah. other things, but when we're looking for these people, um, you know, do you have ideas? Are they friends of friends? Or are you, like, posting on forums? Uh, what do you? How yeah, do you tell me, man. These people. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, so it's on networking. Um, I have. Uh, I, I mean, I'm constantly taking meetings. Uh, 
friends of friends, basically. People introducing me to people. You have to just talk about it as much as possible and hope something serendipitous happens. Somebody, you know, sees your vision and, and catches on to that. Um, it's hard in Boulder, especially, because you get a lot of developers. In San Francisco, you see a lot of developers to jump ship and start their own thing. I mean, that's that's the thing to do there. But here in Boulder, everyone's a little bit conservative. Uh, so that's that's difficult. And there's also a, an age gap, usually, between me and most of the developers who, who would be possible co-founders. But, um, yeah, it's just hitting the streets and meeting as many pe people. And then when you find someone you think might be interesting, building a relationship with them long term. You can't be done in a day or even, like, a couple meetings. Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, and, and, and some founders are engineers, you know, others are marketing guys. You know, what, you know, are there, you know, what do you think the distinct advantage of being a designer and a founder is? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think, obviously, the distinct advantage of being a, a developer is you can build, right? <laughs> you get shit done, and it's, you know, sit down, okay, we need this, we build it, right? Um, Awesome for lean methodology, all that, all that good stuff. But uh, as a designer, I think you have a better understanding of product than, especially as a user experience designer and a visual designer, than most developers. I think developers come to the table looking at things in a very, very detailed manner, in a very uh, trees, not forest manner. Um, and as a user experience, user interface designer. I, I really think of things as the, the general, I see the whole picture, um, and I think of things in a product manner, and I think that helps a lot. Um, I also think that, you know, beauty in a product and, and beautiful user experiences are really, really important, so that that's obviously important too, and you have a skill set, whereas if you're just a business person, and I think this is the big one, and the reason I became a designer in the first place is... You have a skill set, and if you're just a business guy, it's really hard to get people to, to want to work with you. But if you have some skills, people are a lot more willing to, to take a chance on you. So. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Um, when you were working at Techstars and then uh, at Brandfolder, um, you know, you, you, early in the interview, you mentioned that you, know, you thought working at a startup was the most important thing, that that's where you learn the most. What were some of those lessons that yeah. you learned? Interesting. Um, I learned to always be upfront with your employees. Uh, I had some issues with um, our founder, and and I, I don't want to go into them specifically, but but just the path that we took. Um, it was really uh, it was a negative experience, and that made me not want to to be committed to the startup. Uh, and so that. That's a big one. Um, having a strong vision. So you either delegate your tasks as a founder and allow your your employees a very you know to have a vision and to execute on that vision, or you have the vision and you delegate to your employees to execute on the vision. But you can't waver. You either you have to be one or the other. If you're in the middle, you don't have a vision, but you don't delegate the vision then you're not going to get anything, you're not going to get good work product out of your employees and they're not going to be satisfied. Um, so those those are two big ones. Um, another big one raising is a marathon, not a sprint. And you have to work your ass off and hustle. And you can't just, you know, if you're a tech service company or a YC company or whatever, you can't just sit back and say, yeah, we're a tech service company, we're going to raise money, it's going to be easy. Having a good culture is really important, and I think that's, you know, a lot of people know that. Uh, we didn't really have a land folder, and that was a huge negative. I didn't realize how important that was, but just getting people excited to be there, you know, creating experiences that the whole startup can share is really important. Um, I think that. Those are, those are some good ones. Obviously, there's that I'm not thinking of right now. But uh, I also think um, being clear in your objectives for the startup. You know, weekly sprints, you got to be very clear of what you need to get done. Monthly sprints, you have to be very clear. Everyone has to be on the same page. 
Uh, and I think you need to listen to your employees when they are telling you what objectives needs to need to be, because they are deeper into you know that that sphere than you, you are. So as a founder, we need to get this done. This is the most important thing for moving the needle, and you have to listen to that and incorporate that into your sprint. So you know, one of the first thing you mentioned there was you know was was the vision. What kind of is the is the end vision or end goal for Truthly? So the end vision, and these are always flexible, obviously, but the end vision is to be the trusted source for health information. So right now, WebMD is a trusted source for diagnosis. But for all other health content, like I said, for wellness and for treatment, uh, there's really no trusted source. We want to be that first Google result, that second Google result for any kind of health query. Um, and people know, OK, when you go to Truthly, you're going to get research backed, really easy to understand, you know, quick quality information. And um, I think that's really powerful. So that's the first goal. And the second goal is to be uh, the analysis platform for for health information, to, to be this groundbreaking analysis platform that has never really, like, no one's ever done this before, the things that we're trying to do. Um, analyze uh, the relationship, our, our, our relativity between a, a user's health history and, and uh, research, right? Or analyze trends across research and say, this is actually what the research shows. Because right now, the only way people get that information is a doctor reads you know, 10, 15 pieces of research and makes an, an assertion. Or uh, a researcher does a meta-analysis for two years and makes an assertion. We can do that assertion in you know, minutes with the data that we're going to have. So uh, being able, like the, the forefront of health recommendations and health information is, is the other big vision. Definitely, definitely. Well, um, we're kind of reaching the end of the interview here. You've you've given yeah. away, I feel like, a ton of of kind of insightful pieces of advice. Um, Hopefully, I'm wondering if there's is the, if there's anything left uh, you'd like to to tell any of the entrepreneurs or designers out there watching this. Yeah, if if you are are young and ambitious, and the thing you want to do is start a startup, first realize it's not easy and it's not always fun. <laughs> the second thing is um, hit the streets and meet as many people as you can because that, that is the number one thing. I think the number one key for success is just network your ass off. Um, third thing is develop a skill. Uh, and you probably already, most of these, the people listening probably already have some sort of skill set. Uh, but develop a skill set that you can market and, and be a part of a founding team. Um, and the fourth is love what you do, but everyone says that, but it's true. Uh, I can't, like, I've been getting job offers for the past month, and I'm like, man, these job offers are tempting. I've been uh, making negative money for the, <laughs> the past couple months, but uh, I, can't, I can't leave this. Like, this is, this is the same to me as a child, and I think the... It's so important just to have in the world, like not just to me because I want to use it, but because I think humanity would benefit from it so much um, that I can't, I can't leave it. I love it, so I think that's important. Well, Alex, thanks for joining us. Um, where can people find you? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter username is at also color. Uh, you can check out our app at uh, truthlyapp.com. That's T-R-U-T-H, like truth without, truthfully without the F, truthlyapp.com. Um, and uh, you can email me at alex at truthlyapp.com. Uh, yeah, and you can have me and, you know, shoot me an email. I'm, I'm always willing to talk, so. Great. Well, Alex, it was a pleasure having you on the show. All right, everybody. That's our show today. One thing I forgot to mention early on was that this is our 20th episode, or my 20th episode. For those of you who have been around watching since the beginning, I, I just want to say I, I do appreciate it. Uh, as usual, feel free to reach out to me at Signal Tower or at Samuel R. Solomon on Twitter. And absolutely, highly recommend 
subscribing to our newsletter so you're the first to know whenever we publish a new interview. Once again, thank you.